What up, though, everybody? It's your boy Shane G. We are back once again with Politics as Usual right here on the Ethos Media Network. Appreciate y'all for tuning back in with me. This is episode three. And uh, for those of y'all who are tuning in for the first time, basically what we do here, we just connecting the dots. We're just letting you guys know why things are the way they are. Um, you know, things seem unfair. Seems like a lot of people are struggling out there. What I want to do is break down why. You know, it's not that that many people are just lazy all of a sudden. It's not that, uh, you know, everybody just all of a sudden wants to be rappers and they, they're giving up on everything else or, you know, whatever the, the theories are. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just not really that. So um, what I'm here to do for y'all is just, uh, you know, break down really what's going on. You know, I just want to share some of the information I got. So what we went over in the first episode, pretty much, we just went over how much money this country makes, the United States of America. We went over how much money we make, all the businesses, all the industries, all the money that we make combined, where that money's being spent. Second episode, we went over how your tax dollars are being broken down and where that money's going as well. So um, pretty much, I'm just letting you guys, you know, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just trying to paint a picture for you guys. As far as uh, where our money could be going, where it is actually going, how much we actually have and how much we got compared to other countries. You know what I mean? Because all that kind of stuff is important and it's going to help paint this picture. And what I want to get into today is why it's allowed to be that way. So um, one of the things that I want to cover before we get to why it's allowed to be that way is um, I want to cover. One thing that that is uh, rarely discussed in uh, in a lot of circles and <clears throat> this thing that's rarely discussed in a lot of these circles is people. People will say things that like if you're living paycheck to paycheck, that means you're not managing your money right. Or if you're living paycheck to paycheck, that means you're not working hard enough to get a better job. Things like that. Right. I just want to what I want to do today is is sort of dispel that argument because I want to show you guys some information that maybe you didn't know, um, which may be why you think that uh, I'm going to show you guys some information that maybe you didn't know. I'm going to read some articles with you. You know how we do. And, um, you know, let's get to the bottom of this. Let's see if really people just don't have their stuff together or. If there's more to it than that, let's check it out. So this is coming to us from the Economic Policy Institute. Shout out to them. And this is the productivity pay gap. So most Americans believe that a rising tide should lift all boats, that as the economy expands, everybody should reap the rewards. Again, We went over in the first episode how much money as a country we make. We know the United States of America as a country. Buku money. This outcome can be guaranteed by smart and compassionate policy choices or subverted by policymakers choosing a different path. EPI's productivity pay tracker shows the shift towards the latter since the late 1970s. Keep that date in mind. Our policy choices have led directly to a pronounced divergence between productivity and typical workers pay. And it doesn't have to be this way. No, it does not. Um, Let's get into it, though. So they go on to say. Right here, just want to show you guys this graph. So this is the productivity growth and hourly compensation growth rates from 1948 all the way to 2020. So the gap between productivity and a typical worker's compensation has increased has increased dramatically since 1979. What that means basically is. Productivity is how much work is getting done, how much money is being made, you know, how much profit is being generated, how many, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. That's the, the productivity rate. Now, that used to be tied to the amount of pay that workers and employees of a company receive, right? So what that means is 
the better off that a company did, you know, the higher their productivity went, the higher their, um, their profits went, you know, things of that nature, the higher their bottom lines went means automatically tied to that was the higher the workers paycheck would go. Their wages would rise with that. Now, like this said, 1979, that stopped. We'll get into how that stopped and a little bit of why that stopped in, in a little bit here, but that stopped in 1979. Now, some people's argument would, would be that the regulation is not necessary. The government shouldn't be stepping in and telling the business how to run their business. You know, what if the business isn't able to afford you know, to pay, you know, because that's the one of the arguments against uh, raising the minimum wage is that, you know, businesses won't be able to afford to do that. Well, one of the reasons they may not be afford, able to afford to do that now is because of in 1979, when productivity continued to go up, that was decoupled from workers pay from the employees wages. So instead of it all rising together, as you can see in the first part of the graph from 1948 all the way to 1979, going from 1979 all the way to 2020, you can see that that's separated greatly. The hourly pay for the average worker between 1979 and 2020 only rose 17%, but productivity rose 61%. So you can already see how much more the companies are making and how much they're not having to pay the employees. So I just want to point that out. Now, at the bottom, it does say here, data are for compensation, wages and benefits of production and non-supervisory workers in the private sector and net productivity of the total economy. Net productivity is the growth of output of goods and services less depreciation per hour work. So again, yeah, the output of goods and services, productivity meaning if you're if if you if your business starts off and you sell 10 items of whatever it is you sell in the first year and then in the second year you sell 15 items, that would be a 50% increase in your productivity. So then and then the next year, if you were to go on to sell 20 items, that would be you, you see what I'm saying? That's how that math works. That like from from the start, that would be like a 20 percent increase in your productivity. But from the previous year, that would be an additional, you know, 20 percent or, or however they do that math. But you, you guys get what I'm saying. <clears throat> so that's how that works. So we're going to move on to the next piece of the article where they get into the nitty gritty a little bit here. Now, the question is, what is productivity and why did pay and productivity once climb together? Productivity measures how much total economy wide income is generated. So for workers, for the business owners, for the landlords and for everybody else together for an average hour of work. So as productivity grows and each hour of work generates more and more income over time, it creates the potential for improving living standards across the board. So again, if your company sells 10 of whatever the item is that you sell, you're only bringing in so much money per hour, you know, if you were to average that out. But if you sell 20 items, that's that much more money that you're able to average out per hour. So the higher that amount is, is that that's how they equate what your productivity is. <clears throat> so in the figure above, pay is defined in the graph that we looked at before. The pay is defined as the average compensation of wages and benefits of production and non-supervisory workers. The pay for this group is one appropriate benchmark for typical worker pay because production and non-supervisory workers make up roughly 80% of the U.S. workforce over the entire period shown in that figure. Again, that was from 1948 all the way to 2020. And because the data for production and non-supervisory workers exclude extremely high-paid managerial workers like CEOs and, order corp and other corporate executives, as the figure shows, pay for these workers climbed together with productivity from 1948 until the late 1970s. 
but that didn't happen by accident. It happened because specific policies were adopted with the intentional goal of spreading the benefits of growth broadly across income classes. So what that means is the government stepped in and they said, hey, businesses, in order to keep this, again, not equal, not fair, but equitable, you know, for everybody to, it, it is fair, I guess you could say, for everybody to get their fair share of what they're generating. If you guys make X amount of dollars, you have to pay your employees X amount of dollars based on that. It make it makes sense. And once they got rid of that, essentially, you see what happened. It stopped. So when this intentional policy target was abandoned in the late 1970s and afterward, pay and productivity diverged. Relinking pay and productivity so that workers share the fruits of their labor will require another pronoun shift in policy. So essentially what that's saying is the government will have to step back in in order to regulate the businesses and once again say that, you know, depending on how much productivity you guys have, that ultimately will determine how much you have to pay, you know, your your workers and and how how you know how much benefits they get ultimately. <clears throat> so what is one of the things that caused this. Now, this is one of the major policy shifts that happened. And it led to a lot of different things, but this is definitely what what caused the ripple effect that allowed for laws to be repealed or regulations to be repealed, like the ones we were just discussing. Um, those regulations that, you know, made sure that workers were compensated fairly for the amount of productivity that they were generating. Situations like this that we're about to bring up right now, the Supreme Court decision, Buckley versus Vallejo. This is one of the things that stopped that. So Buckley versus Vallejo was a landmark decision of the U.S. Supreme Court on campaign finance. So campaign finance essentially is how much money are politicians allowed to take uh, for donations from individuals or from individual entities? More on that in a moment. A majority of justices held that as provided by Section 608 of the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971, limits on election expenditures are unconstitutional. In a per curiam by the court opinion, they ruled that expenditure limits contravene the First Amendment provision of freedom of speech because a restriction on spending for political communication necessarily reduces the quantity of expression. It lim so basically what that means <clears throat> is they're saying that they remove the limit. There used to be a limit on how much you could give politicians um in donations and com in, in uh campaign uh donations and you know the the money that you uh that you donate to them there used to be a limit on that but in 1976 they decided that that was unconstitutional because if you limit the amount of money that you're providing somebody you're essentially limiting you're you're limiting a person's ability to express that they want to support a candidate essentially so by eliminating that limit you're no longer limiting their free speech or freedom of expression in this case so that's what that that's what that's trying to say <clears throat> It limited disclosure provisions and limited the Federal Election Commission's power. Justice Byron White dissented in part and wrote that Congress had legitimately recognized unlimited election spending as a mortal danger against which effective preventative and curative steps must be taken. So what he was saying, basically, is that the Supreme Court basically made it legal for what he said, unlimited election spending, which, again, is basically just unlimited money that you can provide to candidates and i'm sure that y'all can see why that would maybe be a problem buckley versus vallejo 
was extended by the U.S. Supreme Court in further cases, including in the 5-4 to four decision of First National Bank of Boston versus Belotti in 1978, and most famously, recently, Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission in 2010. The latter held that corporations, this is the big uh, thing right here, the latter held that corporations may spend from their general treasuries during elections. In 2014, McCutcheon versus Federal Election Commission held that aggregate limits on political giving by an individual are unconstitutional. So that last part, the aggregate limits on political giving by an individual are unconstitutional. So what that means is a human being, one person, can give any particular candidate however much money they want. Now, on a later episode, we're going to get into how they're able to do that because there are some laws on the book that technically provide limits, but ultimately um, they're they're really meaningless at the end of the day because there's you know very easy ways to uh, to break those rules. So pretty much um, what we're seeing here is when it says corporations are allowed to use their general treasuries to make donations. What that means, again, coupled with unlimited donations being allowed, we have to put these things together. What that what that does is now you have, let's say, Amazon, or let's say, you know, Walmart or let's say McDonald's or, you know, name your giant corporation, Nike, whoever, right? What this does is what we, what we end up seeing is if they're allowed to, and these are billion dollar companies, we have to remember, right? So if these are billion dollar companies and what we're seeing is they're allowed to give unlimited money to whatever political candidate they want, and they're billion dollar companies and they're allowed to use their general treasury to do this. What that does is it creates a situation where companies are going to donate to politicians that either a already are in line with what they want and they're going to blow those politicians up, you know, potentially in an unfair way because maybe the other candidate doesn't have businesses that are worth billions of dollars back in him. Um, or what usually happens, and I'll provide examples of this, you know, in later episodes as well, because we're going to get into the real nitty gritty of who the individuals are that are probably the most egregious. Um, it's really everybody, but we're going to get into, you know, who the worst, uh, benefactors are of, of this corruption. Um, but getting back to what I was saying, um, what ends up happening is, you know, you have a Nike or a Walmart or an Amazon or whoever or Google, you know what I mean? They donate all this money to their preferred candidate, their preferred candidate wins. And then you get a you scratch my back. I scratch yours type of situation. You got me elected. Because there's another statistic we'll uh, go over soon, but I believe it's over 90 percent of the candidate who has the most money it wins the election so it's rarely about who has the best ideas it's typically tied directly with who raises the most money which again leads more to corruption because if you know whoever raises the most money is going to be the person that wins you're just going to appeal to all the people who have money and if you're appealing to all the people and entities like corporations who have money who aren't you appealing to everybody else and that everybody else right now is a lot of people a lot of people don't have money right now so um this is a small segment of what's been going on so we're looking at since 1979 roughly 1976 per the supreme court but it really started to go into effect with uh certain corporations we can see in about 1979 and uh, what we'll do uh, again on the next episode is we're actually going to go into 
specific donations that were made in those years, who made the donations, what industries they were a part of, who they made the donations to, did those people end up getting in power? And the people that ended up getting in power, did they do things that were beneficial, you know, for your average person? Or did they do things that were beneficial to those entities that donated to them? And did we start to see a pattern of behavior based on that around that time? Um, so these are just a few things that, you know, we just need to look at. You know what I mean? Um, really interesting website. Uh, if you want to know how I vote, opensecrets.org. Um, I'm not sure if I said that on a previous uh, episode or not, but opensecrets.org, it lets you know who all is donating to who, what industries are donating to which candidates, how much money is being donated to these candidates. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that, that lets you know a lot right there. I'll just say that. So, uh, until next time, this has been politics as usual right here on the ethos media network. I am your host Shane G. I definitely appreciate y'all for tuning in, like, share, subscribe, make sure you share this with your friends. You know what I mean? Uh, leave a comment. You know what I mean? Let me know what you think. You know, do you, do you agree with where I'm going with this? Are you, you know, think, seeing any flaws in uh, in my breakdown, you know, you just let me know. You know, I'm here to here to learn as well. You know what I mean? I'm not a teacher or anything like that. I'm just somebody who, you know, is passionate about uh, my community and passionate about, you know, um, I guess humankind. You know what I mean? Like, I just definitely want to see everybody win. And, uh, you know, I think there are ways that we could all win, you know, and um. I just want to, like I said, strategize with y'all, the viewers, you know what I mean? I'm very interested in your thoughts, though. So please, like I said, leave a comment, like, share, subscribe. This has been Politics as Usual right here on the Ethos Media Network. Till next time. Peace.